why should one transition why should we add another skill to our skill set and why should we actually do uh, a learn machine learning that is going to be our kind of agenda today so thing is like there is this quote amazing quote which i love it's if all you have is hammer everything looks like a nail so thing is like if you are let's say you are master in one field what you will do is like no matter what is the situation you will try to do the work with the skill you already know but that is not the way things happen right now like uh, uh, it was mentioned so doctors are trying to use machine learning to detect when people are going blind and so that you can take proactive steps how was it achieved so doctors and combining it with computer science and machine learning is the way to do that so we need to have cross disciplinary fields we need to add another skill set to our uh, feathers so that is the reason and this is one of the most disruptive technologies which is coming up that's why machine learning is a really hot thing of the 21st century and we need to be aware about it we need to be able to do machine learning whether you are a engineer painter doctor surgeon or a actor it does not matter i mean i read around 8 to 10 months back uh, the actress in twilight she was a co-author in a paper on machine learning and deep learning so if uh, I, i mean even the actors have the potential uh, you know use cases in machine learning then definitely you as a engineers and computer engineers you must definitely have this knowledge so we have this agenda wherein how is the future of the technology what are the google's offering into this machine learning space what are the use cases of machine learning and lots of demos how it is used in live we'll see some examples we'll see what kind of possible use cases are there and kind of like hopefully you get excited and you start learning machine learning and uh, deep learning so that is going to be our agenda today so this is the future of the computing so i said that current technology is a disruptive technology no matter what you are doing so uber was also disruptive for uh, whatever uh, way we used to tra uh, transport so similarly the transport uh, the disruptive technology right now is cloud so cloud is all about flexibility and power so how many people here are uh, lab administrators linux or windows or anything like that we have college kids here right how many people here use linux oh quite many that's good then how many people are lab admins then okay no one so i was a lab admin for 3 years so if you are setting up a linux server and let's say you are installing something then many a many times bandwidth the bottleneck so what you do is like you install let's say a apt mirror on your local machine then you have to configure that let's say if you are creating a your in class system wherein your assignments are uploaded and checked then you have to configure moodle on your system if you want to authenticate your systems for let's say uh, uh, enabling login via your roll number then you need to have ldap set up on it so as a administrator it's not just enough to know have linux knowledge we also need flexibility we also need powerful machines even if you want to do a simple android app we need a machine which has at least 4 gb of ram so that is like you know we are limited by the hardware we have but that is not the way in cloud computing cloud computing is future of flexibility and power if you require a machine which is super computer you can rent it in 100 dollars means equivalent 6000 rupees in 6000 rupees you can rent a computing power of super computer for an hour one hour to get a computation power of a super computer that is the power and flexibility of cloud if you want to create a super computer by yourself i mean you will definitely not be able to do it but the cost it takes to create a super computer is at least 100 million dollars 100 million dollars One dollar sixty-five rupees, I think. One million, I think, ten lakh rupees. You can imagine the cost it takes to create a supercomputer, and you can rent one in just five thousand rupees. So that is our power and flexibility we have. So that is what I was talking about. So anyone who is working in a lab or their own laptops. So whatever that laptop it is, it is a physical location. You have to have that hardware, and you are managing that yourself. Next thing is actually the cloud. So this is what. uh we have so all the cloud providers they provide whatever computation you are using you can just connect to internet and use it so you can just effectively you can just log in from your mobile log into that cloud provider and rent a laptop so instead of spending 40000 rupees on a lap computer you can just spend 8000 rupees on let's say a big tablet and you can use this computer in cloud 
and the power and flexibility comes from this completely serverless technology so here if your demand requires you to have let's say 10000 machines they'll be used automatically so this cloud is a foundation on which the machine learning is based so there is this quote of isaac newton do you know who is isaac newton so the guy who single handedly invented calculus why because it was needed to calculate the planetary motions of the universe so as long as we don't go into relativity that guy's equations and theory can single handedly explain the entire universe and his quote is i've seen further than others because i'm standing on shoulders of giants so right now the shoulders of giants is cloud so what cloud is giving us is a platform a platform on which we can get services so let's say you want computer which is powerful so you have this services for compute if you want storage storage for huge data you have these storage services and when this as a base this is as a base as a first step that's after which future is coming so when i talked about the future of the technology that future of the technology starts from big data if we are let's say we have to sort something using quick sort and log in and the amount of data to be sorted is 500 mb easy to do it on laptop 500 gb impossible to do on laptop when we have data which is big we need different system which can manage that right now our genetic code of a single human person is around 200 gb a single human being you are carrying genetic code of 200 gbs so it you will need a hard disk to carry your dna code and if you want to analyze that by using string processing so knp is the algorithm which is the most optimum to do string search so if you want to let's say genetic analysis or something like that you can't do that anywhere you have to use big data systems and with that if you want let's say you want to do some other processing it's machine learning on top of it so this is the stack starting from compute storage and big data and machine learning so this is the hierarchy of the future wherein using the cloud opportunities using the cloud uh, platform we can do lots of things i talked about a genetic code of a single human being right now we have technology in which we can edit our genetic code we as a students copy a lot of programming code in labs or in exams but we can edit our genetic code let's say you like eyes of thor so you can maybe if you can find what is the genetic genes which activate the eye color if you can find them and you can edit them you can uh, become blue colored if you want to let's say if you want like you want like physique of thor then you have to do exercise but if <laughs> if if you have to do let's say change your eye color that that you can do that i mean you need that big data processing and the potential of doing all of that the technology using which you can do genetic code that technology is crispr if you are interested in that so you are uh, right now we can get our entire genome code profile we can get you know study that we can find which are the important genes there is so many amazing things using genetics we can reverse our age we can extend our life and to do that we have one uh, one api uh, genomics api as a product in cloud as well so a technology of future that is what we have right now with us i hope you know who this guy is so this is the uh, sentence by sundar pichai our ceo so right now we are moving from a mobile first to ai first world mobile was a first way in which we connected everyone to everyone else we have lots of manpower on earth and we because of you know different languages barriers or you know not connectivity or something like that we you know having the mobile connectivity it helped change the world now the transition is happening from mobile first to ai first so machine learning is actually the way where we are transforming everything we do it is a completely disruptive technology used in all the products so if you want to see where it is used you can see google search android play store chrome maps adwords so all these products okay all these products they are using machine learning if you check on the left hand side this is the graph of the projects which use machine learning so since 2012 quarter 1 a uh, insignificant number of uh, products which are using machine learning zero 
from this exponential growth until third quarter of 2017. So this is the growth of projects which are using Google Brain models in them. So this is the growth of AI ML inside Google. And if you interpolate this graph, what it is going to look like, it's an upward trajectory. So Google is an AI first company. Similarly, because it's the amount of power and uh, it provides. So this is an opportunity for us. And the, re the reason I say opportunity is because of this slide. So right now we have almost this uh, is from a survey. You can find that survey on the bottom of the page. So this survey says there are almost 21 million developers and each company wants to inject business intelligence in their product, each company. But out of 21 million developers, only less than 1 million are data scientists, only less than a million. So if you are, a, you are a finance person or even a simple economics, we can easily see there is a huge demand and very less supply. When there is a huge demand for Uber caps and very less supply, search pricing happens. When there is a huge demand for this knowledge, what does it mean for you as a student? It means you have lots of opportunity. So once you have this skill, it makes you indispensable because you have the knowledge of the most cutting edge thing which is there, which is gonna getting used in almost all the companies. So we have this as an opportunity. So if you are the first mover and you get up to speed with ML and AI, it's gonna actually, uh, it, it's a really fun job and it's gonna change your life I mean, because it's enjoying. It's not something you have to do. You'd love to do it. So it's, it's the uh, kind of like machine learning and there are lots of breakthroughs in ML. So we'll see what are the some breakthroughs. So how many people know this game? Go, awesome. So generally, not many people know this game, but many people know chess. How many people play chess? Awesome. So everyone here knows the rules of chess. Chess was, I think, third or fourth game in which machines beat human. In 1997, there was a really publicized match, Gary Kosporov, a grandmaster, and Deep Blue system designed by uh, Intel. So uh, Deep Blue fought against Gary Kasparov and won. At that time, this game, it's a 19 by 19 board, it's a really simple rule, but when that machine beat Gary Kosporov, who was one, he's one of the best chess players ever, at that time it was said, it will take at least 50 years until we can beat Go. That's how complicated this game is. If you want to check how is its complexity, the complexity of this game is around 10 raised to 170. The comp move complexity of this game is 10 raised to 170. And total number of atoms in the universe is 10 raised to 80. Total number of atoms in the total number of atoms in the universe. If you want to count protons, the highest dense element, I think uranium or something like that, 135 protons, 135 or twice and that neutrons and some electrons. So at most you would need to multiply this number by maybe 100. So 10 raised to 83 would be total number of atomic particles in the universe. I can't even run 5 kilometers. And these are the strides I take. And we have these many atoms. And the Go game is much more complicated than this universe. So this complexity, and we cannot solve it by raw computation power. So it's not a brute force thing. Players, when they play this game, they, they know when, when, when they are asked, why did they make that move? They say it instinct. So when you develop, when you play a game for a long amount of time, you develop this experience. And with that experience, they can make a move. So in chess, we have to do lots of calculation. In exam, we have to do lots of remembering. But this here is instinct and the gut feeling. And that gut feeling can be captured by machine learning. And which is like just an amazing thing for a human to comprehend. It's a gut feeling which an ML system can learn. That's crazy. And now this game is like not a relatable game. So let's take a funny game. So this game, I'm sure everyone must have played or at least seen. So this Atari game. Uh, so joystick, we are trying to, you know, uh, reflect, deflect the ball by using this our slide and we are trying to, you know, score. So as long as it hits the ball, you get that uh, block and you score. So this is a ML system, which is learning in 10 minutes. It guys kind of plays like a total beginner, anyone worse than a beginner, but in two hours, in two hours, it is quite as good as us. 
it is it it knows that it needs to take it does not let the ball fall it is trying to get uh, capture the score as much as it can it learned that in 2 hours in 4 hours this is what happens it starts with collecting the points and then it realizes if it puts the bar from ball from this side and it will is going to get the maximum score now that is uncanny that is not just gut feeling it is a strategy wherein a machine learning system knew that if i make decisions that way i can maximize my score now that's creepy so if a ml system can me or strategize that's so amazing i mean it's not just this game how many people here play dota wow we have some player how many people play cs okay we have more cs players here so dota is a much more complicated game than cs so in dota we have i think 115 players each players uh 120 22 powers in a different range and something like that and dota is like a team versus a team and what is the most unpredictable thing in the universe is our humans we don't know how we think what is the decision we are going to take lots of emotions lots of conflict of the logic is yes, stuff like that so using this system you know uh, open ai is uh, 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 dota algorithm in ml it can beat human teams so that's how good it has become at strategizing at deciding at calculating stuff like that so ml is a really amazing thing and ml is quite misinterpreted we are in the college crowd it means we watch a lot of movies and whenever ai ml is there in movies it's all about terminator matrix world is going to end stuff like that <laughs> news is like ai started uh, talking in different languages and scientists had to shut down it's as if there is a murderer who is trying to kill you and who is running behind you using ai and ml that's how the uh, the general portrayal is but it's not that way even if it does come into picture it is going to be at least 2 300 years in the future so you don't need to worry about it so study you have to study right now ai is not robotics like you know the killer the doom of the universe it's not like that it is going to be used in robotics but it's going to be used in a different way it's we are still our technology is still maturing and we need people who can use this technology what this field need is people with skills in all the fields not just robotics but all the fields we need people with skills in science in chemistry in physics in robotics and development everywhere everyone needs uh, the skill of ml and ai so first thing ai is not the robotics like terminator and second thing it's not a new technology it has been there since 1950s and we are we have progressed to a such a level that uh, the demand of ai can be met by cloud and the internet the data which we have so with this out of the way let's get into what ml is so we'll see what ml is so we we kind of have this as a data so when a is 1 and b is 1 c is 2 when a is 1 b is 2 c is 3 so similarly stuff like that so my question to you is what is c how did you know that we can learn it from the data i mean if if someone wants to be really smart and stuff like that so you could say a plus b and some really complicated equation which uh whose value comes out to be zero for these cases but it's not like that we can obviously see from the data that c is equal to a plus b so what you did right now is you guessed the equation of c from the data that's machine learning wherein you are given a data you have given historical data and you try to guess what is the relationship between the output and the input let's say the equation is sorting you don't have to write sorting algorithm then you will be given data unorganized data and you will be given sorted data and by looking if data is like this and after uh, something it is a sorted array it learns that it needs to sort that's machine learning so this is a really simple function but if there is a complicated function in vision so let's say the question is like this detect a cat in a image so if the question is detect a cat in a image then a equation or a function which can determine that is a complex one we can't find that as a humans we can't derive that equation so how do we do it we said that ml is nothing but learning of the function so we are going to let a ml system take care of it so what ml system is going to do it's going to uh, be like this so there is a magic box here inside 
there is a machine learning model which is doing something. We won't go into its detail. When you learn, you'll get to know. So what this system is doing, it is taking an image. It is taking what that image is. So cat and picture of a cat. Dog, picture of a dog. Car, picture of a car. Apple, picture of an apple. So this is how we learn, right? A for apple, B for ball and stuff like that. We see what's the character, we see what is the image and we associate. And when we learn that, we are able to detect any apple. There is no, no one, there is no student who can just detect the apple in just that picture. When you learn an apple, you can generically detect all types of apple. Whether it is green, yellow, pink, anything like that. So we have that generalized, we have that knowledge which can be applied anywhere. So when we are training, there is a word for training, learning. So a machine learning system is learning to learn, determine that dog, this is dog, this is cat, this is car, this is apple. So when you give it enough examples, it will actually learn to what is, how does a cat look? How does a dog look? How does an apple look? How does a car look? And when it has been given enough examples, at that point we'll give it an unlabeled photo. It would be like our exam paper. So a new exam paper, new questions. You have been taught theory, you are supposed to learn for a semester and now you have that question paper where you have to put the answer. If you have that answer, pass, one marks or zero. So when this machine learning system, I'm testing that, that's what I'm doing. I have trained it, I have made it learn and I'm testing, ki, have you really learned? Or did you copy paste? So we did that testing and we find out, you know, yes, my ML system is accurate. So we as a data scientist, when you learn machine learning, we need to do both. We need to focus on both part, the training part and the inference part. The inference part is nothing but prediction. When we provide this image, which is of unlabeled photo, we, don't, we want to find out what is there in this image. This as an input and then when we pass it to the image, which is inference. So I'm going to predict what is there in this image. First side, training, second size, prediction. So this ML system, when it is live and trained, it will look something like this. Dog sitting in the basket of clothes, there is something happening, a deep neural network, we won't go into its detail, but there is something happening and after it goes through it, it decides that it's not a cat, it is a dog. So when we have trained this system, what this system is gonna do? It is gonna easily detect which one is a dog, which one is a mop? So it seems like ML system is really easy to develop. There is not much complication because we can easily detect which is a dog and which is a mop, right? But what about this? <laughs> That's where complexity comes into picture. So, I mean, if, I mean, if the dog is really cute, sometimes it's difficult to know whether it's a dog or a cat. Here in this case, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you know, it's a difficult statement to do. Now, if you're supposed to write a rule, we need us, we need to manually see, ha, huh, this is a dog, this is a mop, stuff like that. There is this confusing guy, this guy. <laughs> so how stylish that guy is, that if we did not have this nose, it would have been extremely difficult to know that it is a, not a mop. So, you know, these are the systems. In real life, things get messy. There is low lighting, stuff like that. People put makeup differently. People <laughs> groom their dogs differently, stuff like that. So it is difficult. And an ML system should be able to do that. That's the kind of like aim of our ML system. So this is what uh, machine learning on the Google Cloud is like. So when we do ML on cloud, what it is gonna look like is this. So before we start with this part, I have this, you know, a really fun example. So last question, last part was this one, right? A dog or a mop. There is this fun example on, I think you won't find the code on GitHub, but there is article. So if you search, can I hug that? So if, if you know, it's like you, you put a photo, it's gonna tell you whether you can hug that or not. So if you pass it a dog, it is gonna say you can hug the dog. If you pass a teddy bear, it will say you can hug that teddy bear. If you pass it a bear, it is, it is gonna say don't hug it. So that ML system, it is going to learning whether it is soft and squishy and bubbly and stuff like that. It is going to tell you whether you can hug that or not. So now who's going to use it? No one, right? But it is fun to do. It's just fun. I mean, I, you, can, you can do that, that thing in two or three days. That's how easy. So you can do weird things which might have feature, might not, but it is interesting. It is engaging. You are learning while doing these things. 
now what we have is like general perception, general background of machine learning. Now what we'll see is like machine learning on cloud. So we have three flavors. So we are going to see this part, machine learning APIs, and we are going to see last part, ML frameworks. We won't go into auto ML. It's a bit more complicated for a beginner. So we'll go into the first part, what is machine learning APIs. So ML APIs are amazing. So ML APIs are nothing but a machine learning model already trained by us. You are just using it. So if you just want to get started in, let's say, a vision API, so you can call simply vision API and use it. So here in India, let's say you're using Uber or Ola. I'm not sure about Ola, but if you are communicating in a foreign language in chat of Uber, uh, it translates it automatically to uh, the native language of the guy who is reading that. If he types in his own language, it gets translated in real time. So you can talk in real time in different languages. That's way of connecting people. So this is like, you know, vision and understanding. These are the pre-implemented algorithms, uh, machine learning models by Google, and we can directly use it. It simplifies our job so much. So we'll see what is the first part, which is vision. So vision does these six things. A label detection, optical character recognition, logo detection, explicit content detection, crop hints, landmark detection. So this is not the right uh, target to talk about crop hints. But I'm sure it's like if you, I mean, guys in the front row, they'll be able to know it. So if you want to get your wedding album printed, it takes at least a month to get the editing done. Because the brightness fixing and stuff like that, it's complicated. Now the example for the guy is not in the first row. When you take a selfie and you want to get it edited, then you need to check the brightness. You need to see you know, what is the ideal crop or stuff like that. So you either use an app to do it you manually change the settings, or Google Photos can automatically do it. Google Photos can automatically detect the what's the ideal crop, what is the brightness, do you want to you know, focus on certain part or not, stuff like that. All that editing is done automatically. You just have to say apply, and that fixes apply. Now that's some crazy intelligence which goes in, into background. So that's a vision API in action. When you are searching for something in Google Photos, it will search inside the photo. When you search for food, it will pull all the food images by detecting what is inside the image. When you search for pizza, it will give you only pizza. Now that is crazy. So that inside image search is there in vision. It can detect the characters, it can convert them into text, you can translate them. So that is like vision API in action. And when you are using it in your, let's say, uh, Android app or anywhere, you can use it to provide value. It's a really useful thing. So this is one of the things which does is landmark detection. What is this landmark? Eiffel Tower, quick and inaccurate answer. Why? Because it's a replica of Eiffel Tower at a hotel in Las Vegas. So if you check here, it's a Paris uh, hotel and casino. The name of the, uh, this thing is Paris hotel and casino. Now vision can detect that. It must have detected that by checking this part. The part which you see here, it must not be present on the Eiffel Tower. It could know, knew to discard, rest everything, and zone in on it to find out this is not actually Eiffel Tower. It is actually a hotel. So it can tell you that location. So it will tell you where it is, what is the description, what is the latitude and longitude at the, of that place. So this landmark detection, see how powerful it is. Next example is this. How many people know what car is this? How many people know? How many people read Harry Potter? How many people read Game of Thrones? Ha! Times have changed. Game of Thrones is more famous than Harry Potter now. That's surprising. <laughs> you are not the right age for Game of Thrones. <laughs> read Harry Potter. <laughs> so, this car is from Chamber of Secrets. The flying car when Dobby blocks the chamber of entry to the uh, Hogwarts car, platform nine and quarters. So this car is present in a museum, and when you pass that photo to the museum, it tells you, it is from Arts and Science Museum, it is pre uh, the car is Ford Angelia, it is from Harry Potter, and stuff like that. So this car is from Harry Potter, and the stuff related to all of that, vision can detect that. Now that is amazing. So this is the you know, power of vision which we have. 
So in case you are wondering what was the there in past, so it is this like this. So if you put select this photo, it says it's a dog, it, it, it's a mammal, a vertebrate. Uh, the breed is Commodore or Glen of Imal Terrier or something like that. And other things it is going to say, yes, it, it is confident that 70% accurate, it's going to be a mob. And rest thing are detected like this. The only mistake is here in this textile. It did not classify it exactly as a mob. And it got confused in the dog in this corner. So it, it said it as a four only. But other than that, it's a pretty accurate system. Nice. So in video, in video, what we have is like we can do label detection, scene analysis, short change detection, explicit content, regionalization, and stuff like that. So we are just you know taking further vision and we are applying it to videos. So we can get lots of addition. So in video analysis, we can. There is one more thing. It's amazing. When you are using speech API, you can convert speech to text live. So ideally, you can get subtitles of what I'm saying live. You don't have to find the downloaded movie and search for the subtitles. You don't have to sync them. It can do that real time. That is what this example is. When you are typing in Google Drive, text to speech can convert it to text real time. The translation API is also great. It's just amazing. So it can translate text from one language to another. It can detect the language. It's one of the most powerful things which can bridge gaps. If you are a traveler, it can save you from dying in foreign country. You can see if it is an exit, you'll know it is an exit. Sure, the red color must have been the hint, but still, if you want to exactly see what that it is saying, you can just take a picture. It will translate it to whatever language you have in real time. So I travel a lot. So in China, Hong Kong, and stuff like that, it's the only way to survive. So Google Translate, and it's like it can translate like with near human accuracy. This is what it is. So this is the on the left. This side we have a Japanese book translated by a human. On this side, we have previous translate system. The last sentence, if you check, it doesn't make sense grammatically. This part is machine learning system right now, which is live on Google Vision, uh, Google Translate. So this, the last translation, and the only mistake it does is A and the. I still make mistakes in those. So it's how it's as accurate or as inaccurate as us. So it's a good milestone to achieve. These are the details of it. So previously, it was phrase-based translation. It was this accurate. The place where we want to be is the orange one. It's human accuracy, and we are near close to human accuracy. We can take input from any language, translate to any other language with near human accuracy, and the accuracy is improving. So that's the translate in action. So we have this as a machine learning API. And the other part, we have ML frameworks. So what do these frameworks do and use? It uses TensorFlow. So TensorFlow t-shirt, I especially wore it for this part. So you see, <laughs> it uses TensorFlow. And TensorFlow is this general purpose machine learning library which can help you do machine learning and deep learning both. How does it look? It looks like kind of like this. So no matter which area you are from, let's say you are totally new to machine learning, all the algorithms are pre-implemented in Estimator. If you are a bit advanced, you can use the next part. If you want to go into exact depth, you can use core TensorFlow. So using these three, you can choose anything depending on your level. So no matter whether you are a beginner, intermediate, or advanced, we have something for you. You can use it to do machine learning. There is a farmer who used to export his cucumbers. And he used a TensorFlow system to detect which cucumbers are export quality or not. So if a farmer can do it, you should be able to do it. So we have this library which is available to all of us and we can you know, use it to apply machine learning and the path to do it, I'm gonna uh, share that with you. So we'll take a fun example here. So machine learning system starts with data collection, preparation, choosing the model, training, evaluation, and final prediction. So what we are gonna do is like we're gonna take an example which is really common in data science. The example here is this one. We want to detect if you had been on Titanic, whether you would have survived or not. Data of all the passengers on Titanic is available. What was their name, which cabin they were staying in, and stuff like that. All the data is available. We are going to take that data and we are going to detect. With new input, we are going to say whether we, I would have survived on Titanic or not. So step one, gather the data. It's available. It's not our job. So data is like this passenger, survived or not, class, name, sex, age whether he had brothers or sisters on the uh, boat with him, uh, PH, I don't know, I forgot, ticket, fare, stuff like that. 
and the stage two is data preparation. So we say, you know, we are going to say first class female and check whether she survived or not. It turned out yes. Third class male, we are going to check whether he survived or not. It turns out it didn't. Now we are going to plot a graph. We are going to plot survival by gender. Now, if you are a guy, your probability of survival is just 20 percent. So no Jack, no who's the guy? No Jack, right? No Jack. <laughs> it's going to end, not going to end well. And if you are a girl, then yeah, 80 percent probability, not bad. Only one girl out of uh, five would have died. The rest would have been safe. Guys, though, it's bad. So we can we can see that by visually. So we prepare the data, we do stuff like that, and then we kind of like choose our model. So using TensorFlow, we choose our model, we train our model. So these are the details. So we can learn them into. We are just you know seeing the overview, and once the training has been done, we are gonna evaluate. We are gonna see how accurate this system is. Once we know our system is accurate, we are gonna you know use it for. Uh, we are gonna optimize it. So that optimizing is parameter tuning, again, more of advanced stuff. And when that parameter is done, it's the final prediction. So you give the data and you get the output, whether you survived or not. So when you give the data, you know whether you are on the left-hand side or right-hand side. <laughs> so this ML system can predict your survival on a hypothetical scenario, and it's quite accurate, 80% accuracy. So imagine if you had that data on a next cruise ship. So if there is a next cruise ship and you are too geek, you too scientific, you can you know, put input your parameters and you find out, huh, if I'm in third class, my probability of survival is 20%. If I'm in a first class though, it is 85%. So you'll choose first class. So an educated decision you can take. And that is what intelligence is about. Doing educated choices in your business so that you lose less money or make more money or stuff like that. So that's machine learning in seven steps. So in short, ML is magic. So the ML part, it can do crazy stuff. It can really, I was talking about genetics and stuff like that. It is really, really powerful and really, really fun. So how do we go ahead about learning it? That is the part which you can follow this part. So if you, are, if you really are serious about learning ML, there is a path which you can take. So I, this is the path. So these are the three steps. First step, learn. Second step, code. And third step is practice. So generally, people just do learn, that to theory. And that is why it's kind of like difficult to get a job, because you don't know how to code it, you don't know how to practice it. So you have to take that in mind. Your final goal, you should be able to do real life projects. So for that, you need to have practical knowledge. So that is why you need to choose where you are learning from, because you want to code it. So you choose the right thing so that you can code it, and then you practice it. That is what we do. So you start with choosing a framework. So my recommended one is scikit-learn or TensorFlow. Then you do the learning. So you do it on simple projects and you practice. Titanic is a really famous one for machine learning. And when you have done that, you can realist, you work on realistic data. So this is the ideal three-stage scenario. So I told you I was a, I'm a developer. After that, I taught students, faculties, and I teach developers now. Before I used to teach students, I taught myself. So ML thing is entirely self-taught for me. I had to hunt a lot of courses. I took a lot of bad decisions. And uh, I did courses which did not help me in the practical. So I have zoned in on the stuff which is important only just for this. So this is like, you know, you can choose. There are really practical focused courses which will help you. So if you check in terms of this one, this entire learning and coding, it takes around eight months. Only eight months is enough to learn and be able to code systems. Next four or five months, you can practice the stuff. So just one year. In one year, you can become a data scientist. That's the timeline if you, you know, take the right path and keep on learning. Not like New Year resolution where you start motivated. I'm going to study in this semester. <laughs> and boom. <laughs> so it only takes around one year or maybe eight months to learn, only eight to 10 months. That's it. All it takes is time and consistency, nothing. So if you look at it from a lazy perspective, it is going to take eight months. Or it is going to take eight months. Those are the two points, you point of views. You can choose your uh, point of view, and you can proceed accordingly. So the path to take that is like this one. So you know, you can take a picture, and as people in the first row, you can share with Everest and stuff like that. 
or if you want the details, I think this is the list which I have personally compiled. So I have uh, went through a lot of courses and I think these are the courses which are good for beginners. So these are the courses tailored for beginners and uh, you can learn ML in a practical way. If you just want a short link to remember all of this, there is a, a Google document which I have created. The name of that link is tiny.cc tiny.cc slash ml dash resources. So it's a simple link to remember. You can get a list of all of it on that link. tiny.cc slash ml dash resources. So quite easy to remember and you'll find list of all the things in that document and you can take that. So I was talking about six to eight months. Follow this. There are good books and everything. You are getting a word class education. This is a Stanford's course. It's a Stanford's course, which I think engineering students do in their second year engineering. So third and fourth year guys, you should find it easy. You can do that. Rather you should do that so that you can, you know, in go to the level of the world. So this is how you can learn. Then one clarification, ML is not hard. It is hard if you do it the wrong way. Do it the right way. ML is not hard. It's not easy as well. So you can't expect to, you know, uh, put up a night and in one night you are ML champ. It doesn't work that way. It's a wrong thing, discipline which we have acquired. It's not. It takes time, only eight to 10 months. Time and discipline and just in that time, you can completely learn this new skill and it is a really valuable nowadays. So ML is not hard. Then I was talking about the language of choice. The language of choice, this is like a graph of popularity on GitHub. So GitHub is nothing but Facebook for developers. So if you really want to improve your life, delete your Facebook account and be active on GitHub. So GitHub will help you a lot. Lots of codes are there. You can be active there. It, has ex it can actually improve your knowledge in a really well way. So the first most popular is TensorFlow and the second is Scikit-learn. So Scikit-learn is great for beginners. TensorFlow is great for advanced and uh, intermediate one. So you can choose both. You can start that way and then you can go to advanced one. So that's the way you can code. And then practicing it is on Kaggle. So the way Facebook is for time pass, GitHub is for developers, Kaggle is for data scientists. So on Kaggle, there is this competition. So we have this competition. So competitions have prizes. So the first competition, Zillow prize, wherein you have to detect the price of a house given certain data. That competition had $1.15 million as a prize. So out of 40 teams, the team which won this competition, sure, it had eight months to go. So number of teams would have maybe become 200 or 300 or something like that. But only 40 teams were participating for a prize of $1.15 million. If you win it, I think your yearly interest will be, I think, 50 lakhs or something. So your package would be much more than it would be after 50 years. You can get that much interest if you win such competition. So there is a lot of opportunity. It's not just money. It also job. You can get a job. You can get published in a research conference. And it's not just things. It, uh, it, it, they are extremely fun. So you know, this second competition is track ML particles. So this CERN Hydron Collider, its aim was to reproduce the Big Bang which created universe. You can find out your own subatomic particle. You can name it after yourself. So the Higgs boson is called uh, the Bose, uh, Higgs boson. He actually hypothesized that particle is going to be there, which was going to prove the Big Bang happened. Similarly, if you find a certain particle, the data for it is available online. So in Hydron Collider's entire data, 200 petabytes, is already available online for us to experiment. So there are so many fun competitions. You can detect planets. You can detect genetic. You can work on genetic code. You can find galaxies, stuff like that. Crazy fun. ML is great. It's like you can follow your passion. You can be creative. You can be artistic. If you are into singing, you can create an ML program which can create songs. I've done that. I, I give input as Kishore Kumar's song, and it can generate songs. They don't make that sense, but if you give it enough data, it, it, the songs are good. So competitions are great. Then what you have is like you know this opportunity to have fun. You can learn, earn, and have fun. That, what else does a student want, right? <laughs> so this is like a really, you know, one, pack, one package in which you can get all the things. So this is like in retrospect, if you look back, this is like, you know, uh, it's my favorite thing ever. 
So this is law of evolution. A thing which is true across every species, not just us, every species. It is not the strongest species which survives, but the most adaptable. If we fight with a lion, we won't win. We won't even win against a dog or an angry cat. But we are the dominant species. Why? We are not because we are the strongest. We are because we are the most adaptable. If we adapt to something, we can overcome anything. And that is what it is. Right now, winds have changed. In the winds of change, you can either build a windmill or you can go back to your house and resist this change. So if you go with this flow and learn this technology, it's a choice which you have. Whether you want to follow the wind and you know, use the wind or whether you want to hide from it. So if you decide to do that, that choice is going to decide whether you're going to go instinct or you're going to be useful going uh, further in the time. So this is what we have. There is Arthur C. Clarke's quote, wherein a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that was in, he's a science fiction, he was a science fiction author. That quote must be from 1960s or stuff like that. But there is an amazing quote from an author, Yuval uh, Yorari. So, I mean, his book is Sapiens. It's an amazing book. There is this quote of his, which I just love. The quote is, pay attention. The quote goes like this. History began when humans invented gods. History began when humans invented gods and history is going to end when humans become gods. That is the cusp where which we are now. This is the technology which is not just life changing. We can extend our life. The immortality which we know is put in the novels could be possible. We don't know. We have to do that research. And the capability and potential to do all of it is provided by the machine learning and cloud. So this is like just amazing future which we have with us. Really exciting time to be alive. We are looking to colonize different planets. That's our aim. So you know, aim big, you know, don't be in the small world wherein we can, we can aim big, we can acquire the skills. So really amazing times. I think where the time is up. So any questions you have, I'll take, take them offline. So from my side, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.